See, it, it never fails. Um, I called the Regional Transportation Committee meeting for Tuesday, August 15th, 2023 to order. This is Chair Steve Conklin. We do not have a quorum yet, so we are going to start with some information items. Uh, you remember the, the law of averages is, you know, last meeting we had an agenda that was about that big and a packet that was, well, this is, this is to make up for that. So, uh, we will go ahead and jump to, uh, actually, let's start with public comments. Do you have any public comments? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna give it a second to see if we have any hands raised online or in the building. And I do not see any at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll call your attention to attachment A, which is the July 18th, 2023 RTC meeting summary. Uh, and we will move, we'll jump ahead right now to item number seven. Okay, stand by, we'll have a quorum momentarily. So Emily, you may not go next. We'll see here in a second. Oh, okay. We have a quorum, there you go. So we will, we will follow the agenda as, uh, Sorry about that, Emily, but thank you for, for being willing to, to step in there. Just, it just builds anticipation for when you're, you're up. So with that, we will move to action item, uh, the fiscal year 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, Type Control Project and Program Delivery Manager. The floor is yours. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, so this morning, we are ultimately looking for your recommendation to the Board of Directors for tomorrow night on three items, three documents, the 2427 Transportation Improvement Program, the Ozone Conformity Determination Document, and the State Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. Now, uh, a link to all three of these documents is included within your packet. Um, in addition to a couple other items, uh, one is the errata sheet, which outlines changes to projects from the public hearing version from the public hearing last month um, to the action version that you see today. And then also there is a summary of the public comments received on this draft document. So how do we get from a regional vision to a reality of having projects programmed for the next four years. Um, and that is done through the Transportation Improvement Program. The TIP itself is not created within a bottle. It uses the goals, objectives, investment priorities contained within both MetroVision and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, especially when we get to the applications, that is also um, a focus of those two documents. So, the TIP is it itself is a program of uh, four years that ties specific dollars and dedicated funding to individual projects. And looking at the Dr. Cog directed funding, um, there's calls for projects that take place every four years. Um, and Dr. Cog has allocation authority over five, um, five funding sources. The first four of them listed here are federal and the uh, fifth one is the state multimodal um, transportation and Mitigation Options Fund. But the TIP itself does not just include projects um, that are selected by Dr. Cog. It also contains all projects uh, with federal and state transportation funding. So through CDOT, through RTD, congressional allocations, and perhaps even a local project or two um, if, it's, if it's regionally significant uh, for air quality. A new document and therefore our new program and therefore document itself is created every two years. Again, even though calls for projects typically happen every four years. And this document after it's created is not static. Um, it's often adjusted through amend, uh, administrative modifications and amendments probably 10 to 11 times a year. The program itself has three major elements. Um, the first being the funding allocation process. Um, this is best described on that graphic there on your right. Um, the two main elements being the regional and sub-regional share funding. Um, there's also set-asides that are taken off the top before those calls for projects for regional and sub-regional uh, take place. The second major element is what we call sub-regional forums. Again, relatively new within the last um, couple TIP cycles. 
Uh, a forum is the county and all of the municipalities within that county. Um, and so this is a way for Dr. Cog really to look at those individual forums and inject those local values into the application process, but also as a whole and as a region to really look at those visions that are set up within the TIP process, again, carried over from MetroVision and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Any of those recommendations ultimately made by the forum are made back to the Dr. Cog board and included within um, these, uh, this document. And again, the third major element is the document itself, um, containing many of the federally required elements um, to make this uh, a required and federally approved document. So the calls for projects that took place for this tip, um, for those who were involved, it was quite unique. It was a little bit different for us. Um, and it stretched almost a year and a half period, having four calls for projects versus the normal two. Um, again, those five federal sources that uh, we talked about earlier, um, covering six years all the way back from the last fiscal year, um, 2022, all the way out to 27, and covered not only the current 22 to 25 tip, but we also look to develop this tip that we're looking for recommendation here this morning, covering 24 to 27. Uh, and this is primarily due to three major elements when we're looking at this document. Um, there was the timing of the new federal legislation, IIJA, um, and just when that came out and when the funds were available. Um, a couple years ago, the, the state adopted the uh, greenhouse gas roadmap. Um, so there was implications in terms of, at first, the RTP. So we wanted to make sure that both the TIP and the RTP were sort of separate when holding these calls for projects. Um, and finally, the state, through the adoption of a longer period of time, for the Multimodal Options Fund and when those came available, and especially as, as the state looked at that funding source, tied in another federal source to that, making a majority of those available within those first two years, 22 and 23. So again, there was a lot of moving parts, the need to have the four calls for projects versus the two. But each one of these four calls for projects really was its own beast, if we want to call it that. Um, it did have a specific project and in their own individual criteria. So when we're really looking at one individual call for projects, or maybe even a set, say calls one and two, where we were primarily programming the 22 to 25 um, tip, it is really difficult to look at individual calls and say, this is sort of what those calls produced, or this was the result of that one project sponsor over a certain number of calls. It is best, at least from our perspective, to look at all four of these calls um, collectively when we're trying to describe sort of what was the outcome. And we'll get to a little bit of those details here in a minute. But overall, almost a half billion dollars in Dr. Cog investment um, over this time period, 2.2 overall when we look at all of those funding sources. There's also air quality conformity and the state greenhouse gas to really look at when we look at these documents. Because based on our non-attainment status, um, through the Regional Transportation Plan and the Transportation Improvement Program, um, these plans must reduce pollutants. And when we talk about um, air quality conformity, these pollutants, we're not looking at individual projects. We're looking at a collection of projects and what do they look like regionally. As mentioned earlier, two or three years ago, there was a new state requirement um, for any new or amended plans. So this is the really talking about the regionally significant for air quality projects that are contained within the RTP and the TIP um, to achieve greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. So ultimately, what were those results? Um, real, again, really looking at those regionally significant projects um, and since those regionally significant projects in this new 24 to 27 TIP document are also contained in the Regional Transportation Plan as, again, required by federal law, and all of those investments are consistent with what was already in the RTP, there was not necessarily a new um, analysis run for this TIP. Again, because, again, looking at those regionally significant projects, they matched exactly one for one what was already in a federally improved document. So again, looking at those results, this tip passed those pollutant emission tests for the regional air quality conformity. Um, it also complies with the state greenhouse gas planning rule. 
So just in conclusion on the next few slides, we just wanted to give you a taste of, well, what will this TIP ultimately accomplish? When we take a look at the funding breakdown, 62% um, of the funding will go towards active transportation components, 23% to transit and 14 road. Again, this is not necessarily looking at the individual projects by project type. Um, there are multiple projects that are contained within this document that have that are um, planning to complete multiple types of scope items. So again, for example, most of most if not all of the roadway projects have an active transportation component. So again, when we look at just the funding alone, 62% of that funding will go towards active transportation components, 14 road and 23% for transit. 190 intersections will be improved for all modes. 95 miles of active transportation uh, facilities will be built. Continuously need to look towards that next four year cycle. So 34 studies will prepare us for those future investments. 70% of projects will implement complete streets. 80% of projects will uh, improve those connections to transit. And finally looking at sort of where those projects are, 65% of them will be in or near an urban center. 70% of them are on uh, the high injury network as defined by Dr. Cog. And through their scopes of work in their applications over the next five years, uh, projected to uh, reduce or have 51 fewer fatal crashes and 302 fewer serious injury crashes. So I'd be happy to take any comments or questions you may have. Otherwise, the proposed motion is up there on your screen. Have any questions or comments? Uh, Dr. Williams. Um, I'm just wondering how the overlap between the tip that ends in 2025 and the one that starts in 2022, there weren't any projects that fell in both of those or how did that work? So it's not really too much different um, than what we would typically do. Um, through primarily through calls one and two, uh, we were looking to program 22, 23, and 24. Um, all of those projects, as appropriate, did carry over to this new 24 to 27 tip. Now, so there's sort of two triggers as to why it would carry over. The first, if it had funding in 24, um, it would for sure carry over um, because, again, that funding needs to be allocated in the current TIP. But there's also sort of a second test that we go through, and um, it has to do with the obligation of funds. So if a project in the current TIP has obligated their funds, we wouldn't necessarily move that project over. But if, it has, if there's funds that have not been obligated, then it would carry over. So essentially when we looked at calls one and two versus three and four, trying to move things into the appropriate tip, every single one of those projects as an outcome of calls one and two did end up transferring to calls three and four. So then that's primarily just because of the timing, the way that these two tips are, are situated. But in, in a general sense, that's sort of the two rules that we would follow to determine how projects would uh, be placed in either tip. Dr. Rosenthal. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so looking at this section where it talks about the air quality conformity is regional and not based on individual regionally significant projects, how do you calculate sort of the, the total when you look at all the projects that are being funded? How do you say like, well, this one is maybe valued more or less in that calculation of what constitutes um, conformity? And so maybe just talk a little bit more about, oh, direct it over here, sorry. <laughs> That's fine, because I'm uh, going to redirect so, so this somewhere else. More about <laughs> this like, not my area of expertise. Right. <laughs> I'll answer that, Director Rosenthal. Thank you very much for that good question. So uh, air quality conformity and greenhouse gas analysis, both of them, but for your question of air quality conformity, are regional analysis, so they're not project-based. Right. And under federal law for air quality conformity, we're looking at the plan, the, the first the regional transportation plan as a whole, and then the transportation improvement program, which implements the RTP, rests on the air quality conformity determination for the RTP. So without putting you to sleep with a lot of details, 
in a nutshell, we have what are called motor vehicle emissions budgets that are set for us in this analysis, and we work cooperatively with several agencies, but they're set through the state implementation plan for air quality that's prepared by the Regional Air Quality Council. We need to demonstrate that the Regional Transportation Plan meets those you know, motor vehicle emissions budgets for air quality conformity analysis, and we do that every time we update or amend the Regional Transportation Plan. When we make that finding for the Regional Transportation Plan, again, because under federal law, the TIP implements the plan, the TIP also carries forward that sort of analysis, that, that designation for the RTP of having passed uh, re, uh, air quality conformity analysis. Does that answer your question? Uh, it, that, was, that was exactly correct, Director. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe make it a little bit simpler. We, we analyze the full set of projects that's included in the plan or the TIP through a model of the entire transportation system and analyze the system as a whole. The distinction is we don't analyze each project individually by itself and say this project generates this much um, in terms of emissions. It's the full set because you can't, you can't, with hundreds of projects that are in the regional transportation plan, you could never just analyze each individual project and add everything up. You really have to look at the whole transportation system together, and that's how we do the regional assessment. Oh. Other questions, comments, or a motion? Director Wheel. A move. I have a second. Thank you, Mr. Silverstein. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed nay? And any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you very much. That will move ahead to the fiscal year 2025 Transportation Demand Management or TDM Transportation Improvement Program, TIP, set aside program and uh, funding rec recommendations. Uh, Isha, sorry, Makashun, I, I am having real trouble saying that. I apologize. Mokshugandam. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for being here this morning. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Nisha Mokshugandam from the Way to Go program. Um, and today I'm going to be sharing our recommendations for which projects we'd like to fund for the TDM set aside. Um, and talk a little bit about the process of reviewing the, uh, I'm sorry, the process and the purpose of the TDM set aside and uh, what types of projects are eligible. We'll also talk about the process that the review committee um, undertook to um, make sure that, that each project uh, was eligible and should be funded. Um, so the set aside is one of Dr. Cog's transportation improvement program or TIP grants, and this funds transportation projects in the region. The TDM non-infrastructure projects uh, set aside funding is intended for marketing, education, and outreach, and also research projects that help commuters find alternatives to driving alone. And in March 2023, Dr. Cog's board of directors voted for all set asides to be governed under a common TIP policy for fiscal years 2024 through 2027. The projects that are eligible for this funding should demonstrate that they can improve air quality while reducing traffic congestion. And priority goes to projects that are innovative, replicable, and improve access to transportation for people across the board. For the, oh, sorry. So for the upcoming funding cycle, $1 million has the, become available over a two-year project period. Um, the funding will become available in fiscal year 2024, and the review panel, who I'll introduce in the next slide, reviewed each project submission and scored them individually, ultimately coming up with a ranked list of recommended projects. Um, the review panel prioritized submissions that projected greater reduction in vehicle miles traveled. And additionally, a team of Dr. Cog's staff performed a data-driven analysis. The review panel consisted of seven individuals from Dr. Cog, as well as from partner agencies, including CDOT, RAC, and RTD, um, and as well as uh, CDPHE. 
So I'll talk a little bit about the application process and the timeline. So back in April, Dr. Cog hosted a mandatory application workshop that project sponsors were required to attend. And at that workshop, we talked through eligibility requirements. We talked through the process of uh, submitting an application. And Dr. Cog's staff was also available at that point to answer questions that any sponsors might have. Uh, sponsors were then given two weeks to complete a letter of intent. And during that two weeks, Dr. Cog was also available to provide guidance on how to best strengthen those letters of intent. Um, once we received those, Dr. Cog staff reviewed them, and we worked with project sponsors very closely to, again, identify areas for improvement and for refinement of those proposals. We were then, uh, we then invited sponsors to submit an application. And once the applications were submitted, the review committee looked over those, reviewed them, and um, analyzed them over two weeks. Finally, uh, each project member or committee member ended up scoring each project. Um, and overall, Dr. Cog received 12 applications from 11 project applicants. So in the next couple slides, I'm going to talk about the six projects that are being recommended for funding in full. And then for your reference, all of this information is available on page 36 of your packet. Um, I'm then going to share a seventh project that was chosen to be put on a wait list. So the very first project was submitted by Denver Streets Partnership, and it seeks to establish a mobility benefits district along the East Colfax Corridor. The agency would use the funding to educate businesses and residents on what mobility options exist for commuters who are moving to the area, and it would explore um, solutions for managing parking demand. I'm sorry, people who are moving through the area. Um, and then the second proposal that the committee recommends for funding was presented by Downtown Denver Partnership and would be an expansion of the existing Viva Streets program. Um, they are looking to expand this program by expanding promotions to target black communities and other communities of color. And this event provides a supportive environment for residents to move through the Denver region by bike. The committee also recommends funding the welcome kits for Sun Valley residents uh, submitted by West Corridor. This would be basically a marketing and education program intended for residents of the neighborhood, letting them know what transportation options exist in their area. And these materials would also be translated into Vietnamese and Spanish and made culturally relevant. Smart Commutes proposed flex ride um, proposed project to use data to explore boundaries for flex rides in the northern part of Dr. Cog's region was also recommended for funding. Um, project sponsors are looking to optimize flex ride services by using data to increase ridership, reduce travel and wait times, and improve accessibility, hoping overall to lower costs. And then the fifth ranked project recommended for funding by the review panel was submitted by Boulder Chamber BTC. And the Gun Barrel On-Demand Microtransit Shuttle will serve about 12,000 commuters who relied on RTD's 205 route. RTD, the City of Boulder, and Boulder County support this proposal, which would use set-aside funds to educate residents on a proposed flex shuttle service that would move through Gun Barrel. And finally, the committee recommends that the sixth project be funded. This was submitted by Northeast Transportation Connections and would seek to explore the development of a microtransit community connector serving the southwest corridor of Commerce City. Um, this funding will be used by sponsors to evaluate route options and provide awareness of the service to residents. And this will, uh, program will be modeled closely to the GES and Montbello connectors. In case any approved project sponsor returns funds, the committee also recommends that the seventh ranked project be waitlisted. And this project was submitted by Transportation Solutions and is a proposal to use set-aside funds to perform community-based social marketing to help increase ridership at four key station areas near Denver University, CU Denver. The marketing campaign would also help address DU leadership's concerns over student and staff ridership decreases since the pandemic. So as I mentioned when describing the committee's methodology, when we reviewed submissions, all of the project proposals were ranked and then ordered by rank. So the primary criteria uh, considered by reviewers was potential for reduction in vehicle miles traveled. 
And while all the submitted projects had their own merits with limited funding, the committee decided to fund six projects in full. However, they believe in the value of the seventh project and recommend that if funds are returned, we will offer them to the seventh place project sponsor. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and before you is a proposed motion. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, do we have a motion? Thank you. Do we have a second? Thank you, Mr. Silverstein. Any uh, final discussion? Seeing, yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, a real quick uh, question about the v uh, Viva Streets uh, expansion. Maybe describe that a little bit uh, more about what that funding would do to impact uh, uh, BIPOC community. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So what they propose is a targeted marketing, marketing campaign. So using, um, I would imagine, digital, um, they would be able to target by demographic. Um, I believe they're also looking to expand their marketing outside of the downtown geographic area, hoping to, again, target those individuals. Final discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Appreciate your time this morning. With that, we will move ahead to fiscal year 2024-2025 Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP, for the Denver region, and Josh Schwenk is our presenter. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just as some quick background, uh, Dr. Cog is the federally designated Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, for the Denver region. And as such, we receive transportation planning funds through both the Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration. So the Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP, is how we account for how we are planning to spend those funds, all of the planning, excuse me, transportation planning activities uh, that we intend to conduct over an upcoming two-year period. Uh, this is also how we share all of that work that we plan to do with all of you at our partner agencies around the region, as well as with the general public, and internally how we uh, plan for scheduling, um, budgeting out staff time and resources, uh, just to ensure that we can accomplish all of those activities. So several uh, things must be taken into account as we're developing the document. There's several things that we must uh, conduct as an MPO. So every MPO in the country must create a regional transportation plan, transportation improvement program, et cetera. So we must make sure that we're accounting for those and the work that we include in the UPWP. There are also sets of federal planning factors and planning emphasis areas that we have to address. I'll touch more on those in a second. And then, of course, we have our local priorities. Those are set through both uh, the MetroVision and the RTP, as well as by all of you. So at your February meeting, we came before all of you, had a more in-depth discussion of the UPWP and got feedback from all of you of priorities that you wanted to make sure were reflected in the document. And those were all taken into account in the development of this. So I won't run through each of these, but on your screen are the 10 uh, federal planning factors. These are actually set in federal legislation. So the most recent transportation authorization, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, lists out each of these. They essentially have carried through more or less uh, from previous transportation bills as well. Um, and so these are just areas that we must make sure that the work we're doing uh, accounts for them. And then we also have eight planning emphasis areas. These are set jointly by federal highways and federal transit. Um, and same thing, we just must make sure that we're taking them into account. So in the opening pages of the UPWP, we do have two charts uh, that show which um, areas of the UPWP we feel are addressing each of these. So getting into the details that are in the current document before you, um, the structure is much the same as in the past. Uh, it opens with an executive summary and introduction, moves on into a lot of those requirements and context that I just covered for you, and then the primary section of the document is those actual planning activities. So that is broken out into nine objectives, sort of broad categories. Within each objective, there are a number of activities that are specific topic areas that we want to address. And within each activity is a bullet point list of specific tasks that we intend to work on, as well as deliverables that we intend to produce. So those would be things like plans, reports, studies. 
And then at the end are a number of appendices just for some additional context. So other planning activities being conducted by our partner agencies throughout the region, um, some accomplishments that uh, were completed during the time period of the previous UPWP, and then uh, financing tables showing how we're going to pay for all of this work. So as I mentioned, there are nine objectives. Uh, if you've been a uh, follower of the UPWP in the past, we've had seven objectives for many years. Uh, we've increased that to nine this time. So objective one is primarily just that administration, so staff training and development, uh, federal compliance, things like that. Objective two is outreach, both to the general public as well as coordination with all of our local governments and regional stakeholders. Objective three um, is looking specifically at MetroVision as well as all of our land use, development, housing planning. Objective four is primarily the regional transportation plan and our various multimodal plans. Objective five is all of our work we do around air quality, including um, air quality conformity modeling as well as our new climate pollution reduction grant. Um, objective six is the transportation improvement program that you just heard about earlier, um, as well as its uh, various TIP set-asides, such as the TDM set-aside you just heard about. Objective seven uh, is looking at systems operations, safety, innovative mobility. Objective eight is all the work we do around uh, public transit planning and includes as well um, RTD's transit planning work. And then objective nine is all of the data and modeling infrastructure that goes in to support all of the other work in the previous objectives. So just a few highlights of some major work that we have planned uh, within this document. There is a lot uh, that we intend to get to in the upcoming two years. So we're looking at amending several of our existing plans. So our three non-discrimination plans, a new public engagement plan, a new active transportation plan, uh, freight plan and our regional vision zero safety plan. Developing some new plans. So of course the next two year UPWP has to be developed during this time frame. Uh, new climate action plans associated with our climate pollution reduction grant. A new T excuse me, regional TDM strategic plan. And then the two year update to our transportation improvement program. And then we have some major plans that uh, will begin the work during the time frame of this UPWP, but it won't be completed during this UPWP because these are some larger uh, planning initiatives. So updates to uh, MetroVision as well as the RTP, and then that four-year update to the TIP when we hold the call for projects. And then we have several new um, implementation assistance programs uh, looking at implementing those goals set in MetroVision and the RTP. So some implementation assistance for local governments around our greenhouse gas mitigation action plan, housing and transportation coordination plan, and then our new TIP set asides based on corridor planning, community-based transportation planning, small area planning and innovative mobility, and then our new regional BRT partnership program. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, in case the committee has any questions um, but I do have a proposed motion available for you. Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, this, Josh, this, am I on? You are. Yeah. This is a living document, right? So it can be modified based on new opportunities. Um, I just, I'm, I think we're going to talk later about RTD's new fare free for everyone 19 and under for the next year. And your objectives two, four, five, and eight would be relevant to that activity. So is the, uh, I hope, uh, I'm not even gonna ask, I'm assuming that you all are going to make adjustments to the UPWUP to allow for that kind of um, new project. Thank you. Yes, um, we can amend the document. Um, you actually just had an amendment to the current UPWP, I believe at your last month's meeting. Um, depending on the type of work, it may need to be listed, it may not. Um, so this is specifically looking at transportation planning work. Um, some of those implementation programs may not need to be listed, but we can certainly uh, coordinate with RTD. Certainly some of the outreach work um, might be reflected. There are also some tasks that are written um, a little bit generally um, to make sure that we're accounting for tasks as they come up around the region. So some of that outreach uh, tasks are listed kind of 
a little bit vaguely, uh, just to make sure that we're able to have outreach around any initiatives around the region. That, that was the key word, was the outreach effort. Thank you very much, and thank you for this work. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, do we have a motion? Director Williams. And a second? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. Oh, fantastic. Uh, any final discussion? Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. With that, we will move into our informational items. And the start of that is taking action on Regional Vision Zero, the plan update. Uh, Emily Kleinfelter. <laughs> it is. And, and our apologies to you for the false start, but thank you for your flexibility and willingness to, to step in early. And now we are anxious to hear your presentation. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Emily Kleinfelter. I'm the Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, over the last, I would say, six to eight months or so, um, I have been leading an effort with our Regional Vision Zero Working Group um, to do an update to, or a strategic update to our um, Regional Vision Zero Plan. Within that plan, um, as you'll see here, we have a bunch of different chapters, but Chapter 6 um, is the implementation plan, which really nails in or nails down on those six objectives and then the actions that we identified on how to get us there to get us to our ultimate goal of zero. Um, and so when I was uh, taking a look at the implementation plan uh, back at the beginning of this year, there was definitely um, some room for, for some updates to it. And so we've begun that update work over the last months, as I mentioned, um, as well as also working with our GIS team to uh, create a, co a complementary Vision Zero story map that I'll also touch on. Um, and so I wanted to take today to update you all on some of the uh, takeaways that we've been learning from these workshops that I've been conducting. Um, I do want to give the caveat that this is all draft, um, all at the draft stage. We were still taking in this input. This is all the feedback from the stakeholders who many of which you have um, people from your your local governments that are on there, or maybe you even sit on that uh, on that committee. And so we are taking in this input and we are still just reviewing it and then ultimately going to have at the end of October a in-person workshop to, to do a big scale review of these um, actions. So what I just, with that caveat, um, these are not these are not set in stone. This is what I've been hearing from our Regional Vision Zero Working Group on what uh, feedback they've been giving me. So for some, uh, some background on the structure of what we've been doing, uh, the first workshop was taking a look at the previous implementation plan and all of those actions and doing kind of a status check on how we felt um, we had been achieving those actions and what we felt as though uh, their impact was to the region. Um, and so after that first workshop, we then started digging into each individual objective. Like I mentioned, there's six of them. Um, so we've been doing one objective at a time in each workshop, digging into the uh, level of impact of each action and then the difficulty to implement it within a, a five-year time frame. And then following those workshops, I send a um, a survey out to those to that working group, asking them to then prioritize those actions on within that objective, based on their community's um, you know needs and values, um, and also in that survey, I asked them to identify their community's um, perceived um, perceived responsibility on implementing that action. So whether it's a, a leadership role or a low support or maybe no involvement. Um, I asked for them to give that feedback in the survey as well. So um, again, we've been doing that for each of these objectives. Uh, I do want to mention we have one more workshop left to do um, for objective five, which is to increase, um, increase funding and resources, and that's coming up next month. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, after that one, we will have a final in-person workshop where we're going to take all of those actions and look at them and really um, scale them down to 
actionable items that we can uh, take a look at that are truly impactful and look at tiering them based on those criteria as well as a time frame, um, looking at things that we can implement within a you know one year time frame, two years, five years, um, and also you know comparing that to of course our different tip timelines and everything like that. So with that being said, I wanted to again run through those five objectives that we've gone through so far in our workshops and what I've been hearing from the regional Vision Zero working group, which is our you know, member governments from across the region. Um, so what you're gonna see here are the top three actions that are being, that are coming to the surface from the feedback of prioritizing them. Um, or when I ask in that survey, how do you prioritize these actions? And these are the top three that came to the surface based on that feedback. Um, and then based on those workshops, also the uh, impact that they expect of that action and the difficulty to implement it. So as you'll see here, um, for objective one, improving collaboration between allied agencies, there's kind of a mix of actions and ways that we feel like they're um, actually making an impact. Uh, there was a new one that was proposed that was looking at facilitating working sessions with local governments and um, police departments, health providers to address dangerous behaviors. Um, and that did seem to show up as being a higher priority um, and also having what we seem to be a higher impact, but maybe being a little more difficult to implement. Um, objective two is looking at increasing awareness and adoption of Vision Zero. And this one we had um, a, lot of imp or sorry, a lot of feedback from folks saying that we are really kind of on the right track here and to continue what we've been doing. So um, looking at assisting member governments and creating their own Vision Zero plans or identifying training opportunities uh, as we've been continuing to do showed up as being moderately impactful but also fairly to moderately um, difficult to implement. And then objective three um, is looking at really the design of our streets. And so you'll notice here there was a, uh, in the underlined part of the title, we have added the, um, the action to also lower speeds as well as to design and retrofit roadways to prioritize safety. Um, and so this objective did have a handful of revisions and new actions. And um, I did have an edit, or sorry, an error here on the screen. You'll see that the bottom action, which is um, prioritize design and construction and maintenance projects on roadways on the regional high injury network, um, it's actually been, or two of these have been changed, sorry. So this is the previous, um, these to bottom two are what they previously were in our implementation plan as it stands. And these are the proposed revisions to these actions. So. Um, the previous one would be to provide guidance on implementation of quick builds and again, prioritize design, construction and maintenance on our regional high injury network. Uh, revised actions look like something along the lines of developing an actual uh, Vision Zero quick build toolkit as a resource for our member governments um, instead of just providing guidance, but kind of looking at our complete streets toolkit and other resources we've created um, as another resource for our member governments. And then also, uh, revising that bottom one to have a little bit more um, specificity to it. And so prioritize the funding design and implementation of at least four complete streets or Vision Zero projects located along the regional high injury network on an annual basis. Um, incorporate proven safety countermeasures that have been shown to support lower speeds, protect vulnerable road users, and reduce fatal and serious injury crashes, focusing on the critical corridors and historically disadvantaged communities. Um, again, I did have an error here on the screen that says medium, but that expected impact is meant to say high, as you can see from the, the bar chart. Um, and so that did show up again as being something that our, from my, what I'm hearing from the regional stakeholder uh, group is that this is something we uh, feel like could be really high impact and obviously harder to implement, but um, is prioritized. Objective four um, is improving data collection and reporting. And uh, Eric Broughton here will be speaking on some of the work that we actually are already doing in one of these actions later today. Um, but so there's no proposed new actions here, but some revisions were made um, to make them more realistic impact and impactful. Um, and so this bottom one here initially said, analyze crashes to understand high risk actions, pre-crash activities and demographics to further build out crash piles profiles, excuse me, um, and has been revised to say, perform a comprehensive crash data analysis every three to five years to understand high risk actions, 
contributing factors in demographics. Um, it just seems to be a better, a best practice nowadays to not be performing these types of um, crash analyses maybe on an annual basis and more so on a three to five year type basis. And in those interim years, you're actually doing the work to implement those projects addressing that analysis work. Um, and then again, sorry for the error here. This should read objective six, uh, increase legislative support at the top. Um, and so this is an action, or sorry, an objective where I think Dr. Cog, we needed to take a look at how we actually were approaching our actions because as an MPO, we only have so much of a role when it comes to you know, being in the legislator side, legislating side of things. And so um, we made some revisions and also uh, additions to these, to this objective. And so you'll see here um, that we added a, um, an action to support legislation or regulatory changes that improves state driver education to improve interactions with bicyclists and pedestrians. And that again was um, a really high priority that we heard from, from the regional stakeholder group. Um, and then as well as uh, legislation that would enable agencies to lower speed limits on state-owned highways. So that one um, also showed up as being a priority. There we go. Um, and then I mentioned that we are also working on a Vision Zero story map as well. Um, so I've been working with our GIS team to take the crash profile um, analysis work that's in the Vision Zero um, plan. So it's right now as it stands, our Vision Zero plan is a 99 page PDF document of a lot of really amazing work, but it can get a little dense and heavy when you read it like that. And especially when you start digging into our crash profile analysis work, because it's in a textual text format. And so we are taking that crash analysis work and we're putting it into a web story map that is really hopefully gonna be a great tool for our member governments and as well for us to help identify um, crash locations and the types of crashes that are occurring. Because I mean, when you're in a rural location on rural roadways are a lot different than the street right outside our doorway. And so the types of crashes, the people that are involved, the behaviors that are occurring are really different. And so we did a lot of analysis work um, within that plan to, to understand the different types of crashes that are happening in the different area types across the region and then digging into a little bit more about why. Um, and also within this story map, it'll include some countermeasures um, as well for suggested um, improvements. And um, yeah, that is kind of the status of it right now. We are hoping to have a draft of it to review to the Regional Vision Zero Working Group in September. So coming up just in a few weeks. Um, we are working really diligently to get all of that uh, content um, just filed away and fixed up and ready to go so that we can hopefully have it published before the, definitely have it published before the end of this year. We hope it should be live by October um, at the latest. Um, and here's kind of a, just a preview of what you would see if you were on um, just the urban area crash profiles page, this would kind of be the, the landing page. And as you would scroll down, we would start diving into the different types of crashes that occur with maps and statistics and things like that. Um, we're really excited about this product to put out because I think the GIS team has a lot of incredible skills that we are putting to use to create this resource. Um, and so lastly, next steps, as I mentioned, we have the final in-person prioritization workshop occurring in October with the Vision Zero Working Group. Um, we do have one more uh, quick one, one hour virtual workshop happening in September uh, to cover that last objective. Um, but then once that October workshop is wrapped up, we will be doing internal edits and internal reviews and then have that turned around to go out to the public for a 30 day public review period, um, hopefully around December, maybe even earlier if we can um, swing it so that we can ideally actually have this to you all, maybe in January, I would be preferred. I know it says February here on the uh, timeline, but with the timeline of other safety things we have um, going on right now, I think that we're gonna try and bring it to you in January. So um, that is all I have for you for now. And any questions? Colby. Hi, yeah. Um, I noticed with interest on the crash analysis, and the types of crashes. I'm glad you're looking at different types, but I have a couple questions on that. We look at urban and rural. How do you define suburban? 
So those areas on the outskirts where there are people living, it's not quite rural farmland, but there are a lot of different types of crashes. Yeah, thank you for that question. So you'll see we um, we have done a analysis work to identify our area types in our um, complete streets work as well. And so it's based on population density as well as um, I think also employment density. Um, and so I, I can get you the specifics um, in an email afterwards, but you, if you can see closely up here, we have tabs um, for area, urban, suburban slash compact communities and then rural and limited access highways. Um, so we are taking a look at not just urban and rural, but also again, those the ones that are kind of falling in between. Um, and then again, limited access highways also have their specific kind of types of crashes that are occurring. Um, and then we also dig into behavior profiles a little bit as well, because those don't occur really in a specific um, area type, but they occur all over the region. And so digging into a couple of those prevalent air, uh, behavior profiles that we see and different countermeasures that we can take to combat them. Thanks, I would be interested in that data um, that you offer. The reason being is um, there are parts on the more or less the outskirts of Region 1 that we're in that have a high um, number of wildlife incidents, which are not reported often to law enforcement because they go strictly through insurance. So that's what I'm thinking about as a factor. And then it leads to my next question on your data collection. Is it is it strictly based on law enforcement interaction or reporting to law enforcement of a crash, or does it include insurance data, which would be the ones that capture those more or less first party accidents with the wildlife? So we use uh, data that is given to us from CDOT. So that's collected through the Department of Revenue and that comes from any of the local age uh, departments police departments across the region. Um, so no, they are not gonna be pulling in from insurance agencies for data collection for, for this type of analysis work. Is there a solution to how we can collect that unreported data and help better protect our wildlife? We have a lot of um, wildlife corridors, particularly in Douglas County and Jefferson County that involve a lot of crashes with wildlife. And I know everybody wants to healthy wildlife and corridors. Is there a way to improve that? Or can a solution be considered such as insurance data? I know it's easy to collect it from CDOT, but. Um, yeah, I think that we are definitely looking into solutions for regional data collection within the um, regional data consortium work that Eric will be speaking on in, in a moment, um, and he'll probably maybe have some better ideas for how we can address that, but we are looking into solutions for having more comprehensive data um, when we're doing analysis because it, absolutely there are more data points than just what the officer is reporting that we should be taking into account when we're looking at places to improve for safety for all users and all beings. Um, so um, I do know that there are, you know, wildlife crossing programs that, that are out there. So something that maybe rural communities could look at trying to um, get for their communities. But um, I'm, I will say rural, rural, wild, rural wildlife crossings, so I'll say that three times fast, um, is not my, um, not my area to area of expertise. And from the police data that we gather on our rural roadways in the region, we're seeing that um, roadway departure crashes are actually the most prevalent type of fatal crash um, because of whether high speeds or a lack of maybe um, curve uh, delineation or uh, rumble strips. It's a, it's a myriad of different um, countermeasures that can be implemented to improve for, for roadway departure in rural roadways that could save a lot of lives. Um, and so definitely, need to look at other uh, data though, so I appreciate that. Thank you, we, let, allow me to um, clarify, it's not rural roadways I'm thinking about, it's suburban roadways that I'm thinking about that traverse areas where wildlife cross. So um, we can probably gotcha. interface afterwards yeah. to highlight what I'm talking about, but they impact humans who travel in the vehicles that strike the wildlife. Absolutely. So, for example, a really big 
hundred elk herd that travels through Jeffco and um, Douglas County on a regular basis. So thank you for that. I do want to follow up afterwards if you'll give me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my second question has to do with objectives um, three, and I believe it was two. It seems as though interfacing with local governments is on the moderate to hard impact range, things where you're trying to get local governments to implement Vision Zero and the like. Why is that? That is a great question. <laughs> um, that's a million dollar question I think I would ask these days. Um, I might lean to some yeah, Emily, let me help you out. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, phone a friend, yeah. <laughs> I'll take the hard question. Um, so, Director Mulvey, thank you because it is, a, it is a very good question. I think my answer would be that, look, we recognize the diversity of this region when it comes to safety efforts. We have 56 very unique local governments, and our plan, as originally adopted in 2020 and being updated now, recognizes that diversity. To get to your first question about different land use types, right? Um, we're all different. Our communities are different. And so this is not a one-size-fits-all kind of solution, and we recognize that in putting this plan together. We purposely made it very informational, very toolkitty, very data-oriented, because the needs in each community are different. Um, this is not a, you know, this is not a sort of directive like adopt this plan or this type of plan. It's here's some information, here's some profiles, here's some context, here's some countermeasures that you can choose from that will work for you given the unique circumstances of your community. That's great and that's appropriate, but at the same time, that's 56 different conversations, 56 different contexts in terms of working with local governments to help them where they're at and where they're trying to get. So it's not hard in a pejorative sense, it's just recognizing we're all in different places and we're all trying to work together to advance, but we're not starting from the same place and we may not end in the same place. I think that's the recognition. I appreciate that because um, that helps recognize that it's more in the implementation unless in the fact that some local governments are less inclined. No, and in fact, our local governments, our regional Vision Zero work group includes a lot of stakeholders, but the backbone of, of that group is local government staff members, and we would not be where we are today without um, those local government partnerships. Let's go pick a bust. Yeah, I wanted to go back to your uh, first question, Director Hobie, um, Director of CDOT Region 1, so familiar with the wildlife challenges that we have in the region, absolutely. Um, some of the projects that we have going on currently, we've got a fairly substantial wildlife fencing project along uh, the Genesee on I-70 around exit 254 for several miles, um, but absolutely. So some of the harder data points to capture are, you know, if there's a vehicle wildlife collision and the car doesn't stop and report it. So we do have a system where our maintainers, our professional maintainers out on the road, drop that into their system as they pull over and capture um, the carcass of the animal. They put that data point into our kind of like a record keeping system of what they've been doing out on the road so that we can capture, oh, you know, we had 15 elk that were hit. We've had several moose hit this year as well, which hitting that with your car is very unpleasant. Um, so those are all captured, even if they're not reported, they are captured in our work flow process with our ma professional maintainers. Um, we also for a while had a, an app where um, the professional maintainers, when they went out, if they saw smaller wildlife that you, you know, may not think you'd swerve and even if you swerve and miss them, they can still cause, you know, damage to your car or kill the animal. And so there was an app where they could tap in the type of animal that they observed that was dead on the side of the road. So that harder to capture data, it doesn't always make its way to the insurance companies. Um, same with car crashes. We have pit people hit um, end treatments all the time, not reported. So we're working on it and would love to connect with you for some um, additional conversation around the topic. Thank you. I'd like that very much. I appreciate it. I'm going to go to Mr. Rex briefly and then uh, Director Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And thank you very much, Emily. Great job today. Um, I know you're very passionate about this subject. And quite frankly, you had an incident almost this morning on your ride into work. So I'm, I'm glad you're able to stand there today and give this presentation. I um, Listen, I an earlier comment with regards to this is this topic of safety has always been such an important topic to all of our communities this committee all of our partners and um, you know the results have been elusive 
right? I mean, for us, we really haven't been able to get a true handle on, you know, re- reducing the number of, of uh, well, quite frankly, fatalities. Fatalities are up over the last year on our highways for whatever reason. Um, so I'm, I'm, and and quite, and I fear that with uh, as. Uh, active transportation becomes more and more prevalent within the communities. That opportunity for those conflict points are going to be more and more. And you're, you know, someone on a bike, scooter, whatever that might be, is going to lose that battle, right? Most of the times when we're talking about the personal automobile. So I, I'm really appreciate some of the some of the uh, objectives or tactical actions associated with that, particularly as it relates to driver's education and the necessity for that on my ride home which is only three quarters of a mile, uh, uh, but um, going down 18th, I mean, some of the new signalization and, you know, the the right turn, you know, arrows and everything that I see maybe 50% of drivers actually following that, right? Um, So, you know, I think driver's education is a big component of this. Thank you. Dr. Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thanks, Emily. One of the the things that I really appreciate the discussion about um, the more vulnerable um, animate objects that are involved, but something that we, I don't know if we're looking at it, I happen to know a particular neighborhood of where what gets hit all the time are trees. They're in a, they're in a median and there's drag racing there all the time. So there are very few fatalities but there are lots of accidents, there's lots of police report, there's lots of speeding. And so I'd, I'd like to know that this effort encompasses that type of situation as well and, and not just a fatality that involves a person um, or even an animal, but that involves the environment as well based on its speeding. Thank you. Um, great job, Emily. Thanks for your enthusiasm around the topic. It's absolutely needed. A um, couple questions. So CDOT has a really intense process going on our alternative transportation safety, advanced transportation safety, the ATS with Manjari's team. Just curious, I see a lot of kind of overlapping and parallel efforts here, and how are we making sure we can align some of those? Because I feel like if we join forces, we'll have more power to make some changes. Um, absolutely. I ran into Manjari actually last week at uh, the CDOT Safety Summit up in Loveland, which learned lots of really great things that I hope to bring to my work um, and share with you all. But um, I, I will say I spoke with Manjari about that, about how we want to continue to collaborate within that ATSP work and be more involved. Um, right now, it sounds like there's a steering committee that's been uh, predominantly with some other stakeholders, and they are now at the stage of bringing in MPOs across the state. And so, um, you know, we're ready when when they are to to start collaborating and, and do that work. Um, and I agree, we want to make sure that all of the actions here are not, you know, um, duplicative, and we're making sure that we're not stepping on any toes or anything by any means. Um, and and you know, being the best partners possible. I had I had a couple of hard comments and questions, but I want to be sure to thank you because I do like this prioritization and the objectives, and I really appreciate the focus on safety and on local governments. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Emily. I'm just curious, how much is understood about the the fleet mix as a contributory factor, especially with pedestrian and and uh, bicycle fatalities, bigger, taller, heavier, you know, vehicles. Is that even tracked? Is it understood very well? Great question and something that I think about a lot. Um, and I know that our, our new active transportation planner, um, Aaron Villery, is, is really interested in that type of work too. And so he's currently working on our active modes crash report. Um, and that is something within that analysis work that he's really going to be doing some some bigger deep dives into because there is a bit of that um, noted on crash reporting on this you know the vehicle type and things like that. But modifications or or size and weight oftentimes may not be included um, in those types of things. And we are aware um, that the the size and the weight of a vehicle absolutely does play a part in a vulnerable road users. Um, 
likelihood of survivability of a crash, whether, and it's, you know, I know that we've seen potentially this diagram of a pedestrian's likelihood of survivability of a crash at 20 miles per hour is, um, you know, nine and 10 will survive, but then at 30 miles per hour, it lowers and then at 40. But that was, um, that was a data analysis that was done, quite frankly, a couple of decades ago in the UK with a much lighter vehicle um, that was of a, like a, I'm sorry, I don't know my cars, like a car, car, a sedan. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so that has like the normal, like the, the hood where you would like roll up on the hood. Um, but nowadays, a lot more of the vehicles on our roadways have a grill or, a, you know, that's really right up next to you. And it's a lot taller. And so even, and then, then they are also heavier, especially even, unfortunately, with our EVs and the batteries, they, the pound, the, the weight of a, an electric Hummer's battery is the same weight of a Honda Civic. And so that EV may be hitting you at 20 miles per hour. It was, it, it's, it's a much different game now with, with the, the size and the weights of vehicles. So it's something Emily, we absolutely- Emily, that was my other question. Can we harmonize the move towards electric vehicles, which were of course zero emission vehicles particularly, can we harmonize that carefully with vision zero goals? Because they, these, these vehicles are bigger and heavier. They have to be, at least now, you know, for the battery technology we have. Yeah, um, I, I will say, so our uh, objective six, you know, looking at increasing legislative support, I think that's a, a role that we can play there. There's not a whole lot, obviously, within the other sphere of, you know, car manufacturing that we can do a lot, but we can absolutely do our do what we can in, in the legislative role of, of advocating for, for better um, safety ratings, for things like that. So, yeah, thank you. I, I also wonder on, on electric vehicles, one of the things I hear is that pedestrians and bicyclists sometimes get surprised because they simply don't hear the vehicle. And so I think that's going to be an interesting part of the transition as well. I saw another hand. Yes, please. Um, okay, so quick question. I didn't see anything about motorcycles here. And then back to your point on a, under objective four that we want to improve the timeliness of injury data, which we say is almost easy, but for some reason it seems really hard because we've got a lot of, I know you're about a year behind with the data I have today. So I get weekly reports on fatalities and we've seen a tremendous increase in motorcycle fatalities. Half of those generally are non-helmet wearers and then the other half are wearing helmets, but most of them are excessive speed and a lot of conflicts with cars making bad choices as well. So curious, um, I don't see anything about motorcycles in here and they are definitely on the uptick. Yeah, so I do wanna note, these are not all of the actions. These are, so most objectives have currently about 10 actions underneath each one, but in that uh, in-person workshop, the goal is to narrow them down to, you know, we don't need that, that is just not achievable, nor is it effective to have that many actions under each obje objective. So um, the ones that you're seeing right now are the three that rose to the surface based on the feedback I received from the surveys from the, the stakeholders. Um, so we do have things that are noting on all vulnerable road users, including motorcyclists. Um, and so, uh, but I will take that more into account because reflecting on it, I think that there probably could be more uh, specific actions, making note of them because there is a, a specific rise of users. Um, and then, sorry, can you note, what was the second part? Did you have a second part of the question? Or, uh, that was it. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> to, to your point about motorcycles, uh, one thing I've noticed more and more, I, I believe, and it may be with people coming from elsewhere or whatever, are the motorcyclists that are driving between lanes of traffic, which is legal in some states, but I don't think it's legal here. Uh, and so I'm picking up on more dangerous behavior, uh, and it may just be where I happen to be at that time. But Saturday, you're right, Saturday uh, saw that and saw a motorcyclist change lanes, well, in my vision, eight times back and forth between cars. And, you know, and that's one rider. But as we talk about education, I think it's not just driver education of cars. It's you know, bicyclists and, and education in terms of you know, with the new state law. Uh, where where they can can not have to stop at a light. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of them that do that, not when it's totally safe and clear, but you know th there are behaviors there. Uh, I shared with these <laughs> these guys the other the other day. Uh, I was on a a two way downtown Denver street, cars on both sides, dusk, raining, 
a scooter is coming towards me. The scooter uh, driver has a dog on a leash that is, is several feet out beyond where they are. And as we pass, me being very careful, she also had a dog strapped to her chest. I share that just nothing we can do can fix those type of things. But as we talk about education, we need to talk about safety in the broadest sense of everybody on the roads needs to be being smart about what their behavior is. And, and you know, one of the challenges to get into to Vision Zero are those outliers that are just not thinking. I, I would like to counter land. just a... Some people, well, no, um, I agree. Yeah, we absolutely have to, to take on behaviors. One of the things I learned at the, the safety conference was the way we speak about safety and, and the behaviors we're seeing. And I don't disagree. We've got to address these things. But I've learned is the way to use our words around it. And so most scooter riders are fairly safe and smart. Most cyclists and pedestrians are, are wanting the safer infrastructure, are, are very logical and are being a responsible user on the roadway. But we do acknowledge that there is more work to be done to educate them and to make sure that we're providing infrastructure that gives them a safe place to do so. I mean, realistically, that person riding the scooter, albeit a little bit goofy and you know, somewhat dangerous, maybe was their only mode of transportation that they had and they had to get their dog somewhere. I mean, you know, um, so it's our, our responsibility to try and make sure we're giving them access to safe places to be able to, to use that mode of transportation safely. But, but it's the way I framed it there by saying like most people actually like this, but we have to acknowledge there are, there's out, there's the people that need more education who need more safety uh, training or whatnot. And so, I, I don't know. It's something I'm trying to just frame myself the more I talk about it. Because very well said. It's a, very well said. It's a, it, we can't change behaviors until we change beliefs. And if we, if we think about it in a, in a more positive way, we can hopefully change behaviors and then change the culture. Mr. Papstorf and then Sorry. Commissioner. <laughs> I love the engagement in this conversation. It's such an important topic, so I really appreciate it. Now, um, Darius, I, don't, I, I recall that during this past legislative session, there was a bill introduced to uh, require CDOT, I think, and the Department of Public Safety maybe to study um, uh, motorcycle lane splitting. I can't remember if it passed or not or was enacted. I suspect it wasn't, but you might be able to address that issue. I, and then before you answer that, I think the, the behavior issue that Jessa mentioned about motorcyclists and half of motorcycle fatalities involving riders that weren't wearing helmets, I, you know, our Vision Zero, our Vision Zero strategy acknowledges some of those choices that people have made and part of the strategy to have a conversation with our policymakers around, you know, should Colorado have a mandatory helmet law? And, and is the trade-off around personal choice versus saving people's lives, like where is that choice? A mandatory, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have mandatory seatbelt law, but it's not it can't be a primary offense in this state, and also a safety issue. So you you know, so one one really can't face the consequences of getting pulled over just by virtue of not wearing their seatbelt. So there's less enforcement of our seatbelt law. Those are big policy choices that have significant safety outcomes for the users of the transportation system. And those are important conversations to have that we've acknowledged in the Vision Zero plan, but those are really tough conversations, right? Yeah. I, good morning, everyone. I, I apologize for being late. I uh, I got some had some issues with traffic, but it does relate to this very conversation we're having. I, I totally support the notion of Vision Zero and how we can really reduce the number of uh, fatalities we have on certainly our city streets, uh, state highways, state roads. One observation I have: I live in a in Cherry Creek Country Club, and I've, for the last couple of years, we've been having a lot of work done on Iliff and uh, uh, in front of uh, the neighborhood. And one of the things that I'm observing is sometimes, you know, we, we're almost at risk of overcorrecting. And, and the complication we're creating is also, I wonder if it's contributing to the very problem. And, and I noticed that this morning, even when I came in the, this meeting late, uh, but I did notice that as we're marking streets on 17th, 
and and as we're dealing with some of our issues about multimodal. I'm worried that we're fixing the problem with engineering kind of solutions that sometimes make sense for engineers, but they don't make sense for human beings who have to work their way through it. So I just bring that point up to say it's not all about the training and the education of the drivers and and the and the people who are using uh, other vehicles to get through it, but we have more ways in which people are transporting themselves around through our community from walking to driving on uh, scooters to biking to using their vehicles. And I'm really concerned that it's getting very confusing and very complicated. So one of the things I would just urge is that we don't lose sight, particularly in our more uh, urban communities, about how complicated it's getting for people switching from bike lanes to streets, uh, getting to intersections and who's got the right of way, you know, and who has the authority. So I think we may be inadvertently contributing to the problem in our very effort to try and reduce the number of issues. So just make that point, and it's one I'm seeing personally in my neighborhood right in front of where I live. So, There we go. Thank you. Um, where does signage um, fit into this? Because I think part of the education outreach, yeah, we can we can beat, we can send out literature, we can get people into classes or whatever. But I I really feel that the uh, there's a lack of signage for lots of, of maybe good reasons from the past. You know, you don't want to overload your 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 experience with information. But I think there there's a real lack of basic signage. Um, that I think could be very helpful in this in this move towards an intermodal um, urban area. Um, is there is there a conversation around that? Um, I wouldn't say that there is exactly a direct conversation around it because when you look at every project or type of idea that we're bringing to it, there, it's a comprehensive way of looking at it, and signage would be a part of that process. So um, any sort of new like tip project or anything like that that we would be funding, it would abs if there's a bike ped or safety aspect part of it, signage would absolutely have to be a like component that's required in that project. Um, I I will say signage is fairly non-compliant. I mean, like Doug mentioned this morning, my interaction that occurred with my coworker Brittany was in an intersection where the sign says turning cars yield to bikes. And so we were going through the green light and he proceeded to right hook us. And so we told him you are supposed to yield and he proceeds to point at the sign and say, read the sign. <laughs> so well, everybody becomes more distracted. <laughs> or I mean, I, I, I have countless, you know, anecdotal stories I could tell you of where there are just sign and stripage as a way of asking people to do things that are not the solution. However, wayfinding is signage for um, for information, for knowing how to get places to point A to point B. Um, I mean, I would say the city of Denver has actually been doing a fantastic job with all of the new bike infrastructure that they've been putting in. They've been really diligent about putting in um, all sorts of informational signage around, you know, do not enter, or you know, this is the way you're supposed to move around a mini traffic circle. Um, you know, there's wayfinding signs that are telling you this many miles to this destination at this turn. Um, I would say I encourage you to maybe look, try a different mode and look for those mode signs. Sometimes when you're in a certain mode, you only see your mode signs. Um, and so, like, you know, when you when you take a look, there's actually, I would say, I, I often hear the counter argument that there's too much signs, there's too much clutter, and it's getting too much. Um, so there's there's kind of a balance of how how do we figure that out, right? Of people saying, well, I don't need a sign every single block telling me, but also, what the heck is going on here? So I hear you. <laughs> yes, no, thank there. you. It's it's hard. I know. Three people on the list, and then uh, so. Uh, Director Mulvey, uh, Director, actually Director Williams, Director Mulvey, and Mr. Pekpa, uh, and then we're going to move on to the next topic. We could talk about this forever, and and uh, just want to keep this on. 
obviously we we like this discussion um and i want to come back to emily's point of cooperation and give you all a tidbit that everybody may not know which is when rtd put the electric buses on the 16th street mall they were absolutely silent and the noise that you hear when you hear one of those buses has been artificially added to accommodate the situation and so Sometimes a give and take is a good thing. Director Mulvey. Um, as we discussed language, it occurred to me that focus on fatalities, but in my business, it's often the non-fatality that causes the greater life impact. And so I wonder if um, in considering discussion about our language and what we're looking to prevent, we would focus on any crash impact that may not result in a fatality per se, which is horrible, of course. But, you know, when I got an accident between a pedestrian and a vehicle and that person's impacted with a mild concussion for 5, 10, 15 years, I got a young pilot who can't fly. Stuff like that. Absolutely. And I fully agree with that. Um, when we do our, our specifically, you know, vulnerable road user type of analysis, that's a, we look at the breadth of all crashes that involve them because, like you mentioned, um, it could just be a, a small, you know, bike on car type of collision where they maybe have a, a scrape and a bruise, but they are mentally really impacted and may not be able to get back on the bike or not ride in that area again. Um, so when we're doing those types of analysis, it's really important. And I also I want to mention that when we talk about Vision Zero, um, I think there is, quite frankly, a maybe miss um this narrative that it's like we're trying to end all crashes while that would be a beautiful world to live in realistically you know the safe systems approach acknowledges that humans are we're fallible we're going to make mistakes we always have we always will so we need to make sure we're designing so that those mistakes are not going to be costing someone their life or in a serious injury that like you said has a trickle down effect and or ripples across to, to their community and so um, when we're talking about Vision Zero, we're really talking about zero serious injuries and fatalities. Thank you very much. Wrapping this up, uh, Terrence Packbaz. My comment is brief. Uh, that study that was mentioned was the House Bill 23-1059. It did fail. It was not voted on. It failed in committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Great presentation. That we will move on to the uh, aforementioned Regional Crash Data Consortium update with Eric Bratton. Thanks for being here. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Eric Broughton. I have been with Dr. Cog for just shy of a year now. I'm working pretty much exclusively on this project. I'm really excited to share, share with you what we've been doing and what we are looking forward to doing over the next year. So we've been calling this our Regional Crash Data Consortium, and this is a project that is funded by a 405C Traffic Records Improvement Grant from NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and it is administered by um, the Colorado Department of Transportation and the other members of the STRAC statewide traffic record state statewide traffic records advisory committee. I always say that wrong. Um, but this is a project that it really is about collaboration and the real primary goals we have developed for ourselves um, through this process have been to investigate and demonstrate the value of the regional crash data consortium, look at the inventory needs of the region, and working together to identify and address common issues with crash data collection, processing, and analysis. We have several performance measures for our grants that we've established. Um, the first most being um, completeness of records. With this, there are, we, we, what we've heard from, what we've seen from our previous crash data analysis Dr. Cog has done for the past, I believe, at least eight, nine years, maybe perhaps even longer. Um, on many of the records that come from um, CDOT, if they're not on system, meaning that the the on system meaning highways, interstates, those types of roadways, they do a really fantastic job of geocoding these records. They put a lot of quality um, quality control into those. They it's, they don't put that same amount of work into the non -system, non on system records so the off off system. And while they do go in and do the fatal and serious injury crashes, there are still 
thousands, tens of thousands of records that are missing geospatial coordinates. And that's something that we do a lot of work on and a lot of our member governments and partners do work on. So one of our, our goals is to really reduce the, reduce the number of records that are missing that sort of information from the start. Um, a measure of integration, um, we are looking to improve our capacity to be able to attach the geocoded records we do have and that we get from our partners or through our efforts to what's called a linear referencing system which is a geospatial tool that is really used in a lot of safety analyses um, and something we haven't had the capacity to have before, but it's something we're working on now. And really with accessibility, looking to identify the users of our database and improve the accessibility. Currently, Dr. Cog does have a regional data catalog and we do publish on their crash data that we receive from CDOT and publish on a yearly basis and make that available to all of our member governments and anybody who just wants to look at it, use it for their own analysis, their own safety studies. And we are looking to really um, improve that product and make sure that people know about it and are able to use it. This is just a really quick look at the situation we have here in the, the Dr. Cog region. Um, while we, as of the 2020 census, are about 57% of the state's population, we are a bit overrepresented in the number of crashes um, especially when it comes to serious injury. So through this, open to approved records, through the amazing work that um, Emily and her group are doing, I'm really hoping to bring these numbers down. We started this project, we received funding um, to proceed in September of this year, of last year, 2022. And for the first several months of the project, we were really in a mode of engaging, really trying to bring in people who wanted to be part of this conversation um, we held a meeting in November where we invited um, many people, we had over 70 non-Dr. Cog um, people um, joined that meeting with us where we really introduced the concept, um, had a quick couple workshops, and really tried to drum, drum up some support for this idea. Throughout the next several months, we have been working on engaging with local governments, state partners, fire districts, um, federal partners, and advocacy groups, really anybody who has an interest in this conversation, you know, be able to talk to, and law, law enforcement especially as well, an important partner, to really learn how they're using data, what kind of data they're using, how they're collecting it, what kind of analysis they want to do, um, what's not working well, and what is working well. We have had involvement with some, some groups, including I've been working with um, Emily and her Regional Vision Zero group, and have learned a lot through that group, and been able to meet a lot of um, partners to, who have been interested in this project. And we've also had the opportunity to work with the, um, the state. They have a task force that is working on not doing updates to the officer reporting manual for crashes, but on um, providing a way to maybe update the document that provides guidance on how officers respond to crashes in an attempt to make it easier to understand and improve the way that the um, data coming in is collected. We had a meeting in May of this year where we had partners from the Department of Revenue and um, Department of Transportation join us to walk us through and walk our stakeholders through the ways that they go through the data process. Um, and that was really informative for me and I think for a lot of our partners. We have been, I've been, we've been working on what we're calling our needs assessment based on this inventory we developed and we are looking to publish that um, in September and we're planning on having a second meeting of this group towards the end of September as well. Going into the next year, we'll be moving to a phase where we've collected a lot of information. We're still going to be talking to partners. We're still going to be learning what we can, um, but we're really working to develop and implement solutions to the challenges we've identified, looking at what other MPOs are doing, looking at what other states are doing, um, and doing a lot more engagement with um, different communities. Uh, we'll be having a final meeting of this, of this group as it currently exists um, towards the end of the year and publishing a full report with an inventory and the updates to it and, these, and the, develop, the needs, or the, the solutions that we've been working on to address the consortium concept and ways to address some of these challenges. So briefly, we have engaged um, the Colorado community and the local community through a number of surveys that have gone out. Um, through some of Dr. Carlos serves and also reaching out directly to um, local member governments and other partners. We have had one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with over 40, 50 some stakeholders um, over the last several months to, to talk about, again, how they collect data, what, how they use it, what's working well. 
Uh, we've had the aforementioned meetings, and again, the, media, the involvement with the Regional Vision Zero Working Group and the Crash Manual Task Force organized by the state. This slide probably needs to be updated because we have talked to more than just these people. But um, this, we want to show that a lot of our involvement has come from the local government level, um, the municipals, the municipalities, the counties, um, a lot of people, we've spoken to a lot of folks from the states, including at CDOT, DOR, CDPHE, um, Colorado State Patrol, and others, and many, various other groups who are interested or have a hand in um, crash data collection processing. What we found is that there's several main sources that our stakeholders are using. Um, primarily, they're using data that's collected from their, either the municipal police, um, the sheriff's offices, in some, some counties, um, or those records that are being collected by the Colorado State Patrol. Um, this data then often this data then goes on to CDOT through DOR, and CDOT does a lot of again, working to process and analyze, analyze it, and they're, they're able to provide that data out to governments are requested, typically just to their own kind of borders, um, whereas we, and we have a relationship with DDOT in which we are able to get data for the region, and that's how we're able to publish this, make it available for all governments. We have found and talked with folks who work for some fire, fire departments and fire districts in the area who also have their own records, and there's emergency department records, there's um, emergency medical service records, and that's kind of something we're working on to try to try to get a little more access to um, over the next year, try to see how that can fit into this. But what we've heard from most of our stakeholders is that it is the, the police data, whether it's their own PD data they're using or the state's data that is ultimately again, coming from their PD, that is the primary, primary tool for the analysis. And there are two, there's several vendors of who do crash data analysis and processing in the region. Two here are mentioned. I, I bring these up because we've heard, them, heard about them from very, a large amount of our stakeholders, and they approach the system a little bit differently. Um, to the Crash Magic here, they typically work directly with the CD records as they're coming in. So they, they have different ways of going about it, but they don't, they don't wait necessarily for CDOT to get the record or do any work on it. They're able to work on it, whereas the other, other um, firm here, um, Diexus, with their Vision Zero suites, they typically work with the actual CDOT data. So they, have, they experience the same type of time lag and just different ways of processing the data, but they, they both approach, approach this um, differently and serve our member governments in different ways. One of the most interesting things I believe that I've learned is that many of our stakeholders are using multiple data sources. I think hardly... I don't think anybody we talked to really said, we just use our PD, we just use CDOT, we just use whatever. Um, there's a give and take of different things. There's pros and cons to all these data sources. With the local data, a lot of times our member, member governments are able to contact their, their PD, say, can I get the records for this intersection or for this period of time? And sometimes they're able to get that very quickly, sometimes they're not. Um, it really kind of depends on the relationship that these engineers, planners, and others have with their law enforcement. Um, we've talked with people at the state and we've talked to others, and there's certain data quality controls that to see that data goes through that doesn't seem like that's necessarily being replicated on and many of the local governments. Um, but again, kind of a trade off there is that oftentimes these local governments are able to get that data. They're able to call somebody down the hall and get an email, the PDF, or get a, a CSV from them in a couple hours instead of a year from now. Whereas at the state and our, and our data that we ultimately comes from the state, we've been told that it's very useful to help identify trends, see how different cities and municipalities or, or counties are comparing with one another, one another and can look at the more broader regional trends. Um, they go through extensive data processing and quality assurance. But again, we get the trade-off where it takes a 12 months, 16 months, 18 months to get that data sometimes. I'm not going to dwell on this very long, but just wanted to, to show this is, as I wrote, uh, a non-exhaustive representation of many of the ways that crash data flows to the region. So you can see if we follow along just from the crash to dispatch, most will go in, then to law enforcement. So that'll go to local, local, uh, local PD responding, could be a sheriff's department responding, it could be a Colorado State Patrol responding. 
different different roadways are in have different um, law enforcement that responds. There is a standard form that is used to DR three four four seven, and that is supposed to go to the Department of Revenue within five days of the crash investigation. And even here, it can split from there's a paper form, they can send it into the PDF, they can use one of dozens of records management systems that local police departments use to get that data to them. And as we've heard from our partners at CDOT, the way that some of these records management systems walk officers through filling out the form can have a huge impact on the quality of the data that they're receiving. That data will go to, to the Department of Revenue, who is the official custodian of the data. They'll go to CDOT, and they do a lot of work on it. Eventually, it gets to us. We do a lot of work on it, before we, and we can provide it to um, local governments and other partners. Some cities that we've talked to have processes where they don't use the CDOT data, they don't wait for the CDOT data, they're able to get that data straight from their PD, able to get it straight through one of these vendors. So I just wanted to show this just so how complicated this can be when we're talking about crash data. There's not one single thing which is crash data. There's many different iterations. We have identified several um, issues and problems over the last several months of talking with our stakeholders. Um, first and foremost, I think the main things we've heard have been the location accuracy and availability of location data. Um, many of our local governments don't have access to geolocated data, um, and if they do, it's not, it may not be consistent or may not be reliable, um, and they may rely on us or um, a private company or others to geolocate some of the data if they don't have capacity to do it. The timeliness issue wherein local decision makers want to know what's happening this week, and sometimes the best, some of the data sources can provide is what happened a year ago. And so, really, there's why, part large again, large reason why we get that different sources of data using different, different methods. Although, as um, Emily was kind of alluding to, we have heard from some partners that that longitudinal data can sometimes be more reliable for doing different sorts of analysis. So while there may be an event that happens that is important, and we will, our local governments want to know about it, decision makers want to know about it, planners, engineers want to know about it in case there are anything that can be done to prevent that or some, something similar in the short term, having that long-term data is very useful for different forms of analysis. Consistency of which way police reports are filled out has been um, constantly mentioned by many of our stakeholders. Um, the way that locations are recorded, the way that if there, if there is data for the geospatial coordinates and if it's accurate at all, um, there's a narrative field that is allowed on the crash report that we have heard from almost all of our stakeholders that have talked about it being very, very useful. And sometimes that doesn't come through. Sometimes it's not even filled out. Sometimes it's very mechanical, which is it's supposed to be mechanical, but sometimes it's just, just hardly any information that can be gleaned from it. And then we have learned that the, the field of impairment being suspected is unreliable in a lot of ways. Um, we've heard that many law enforcement um, through, the, through the, the officer task manual, the officer crash task manual group, um, that there's a certain hesitancy um, we've, that's been reported in filling that out. Because even though it's not supposed to have any legal impl implica implications, there is some thought process behind well, if, if someone doesn't know, if they can't prove it, they don't want to fill it out. And so we'll see this, we're hearing there's discrepancies between what a city might have versus what their CDOT data says when it comes to crash after the city has been able to go take take things through adjudication. Finally, the accessibility of the data. Um, the relationships between our data users, including planners, um, engineers, and others, um, and law enforcement vary really greatly across our region. Um, we've heard from some that the relationship is phenomenal. They can, again, email their partners and the, and the, and the police department, get the records right away. They, some collaborate very closely. There's a few communities that have monthly meetings, so they go over crash data, they go over police van footage, they go over red light cameras things like that, and there are some that they don't get anything from them. Um, the most extreme example I heard was a local government trying to use a um, Colorado Opens Record Act request to get crash data um, in a more timely manner. And we have heard from some that they're just unsure um, where to get data and what's currently available. And again, that ties back to one of our key performance metrics of letting people know that our data is here and improving and making it more useful for them. I do, before I move on, I do want to put one point about the law enforcement. Um, we have heard from all of, all of our other non-law enforcement stakeholders that interact that they do recognize that the job being done by law enforcement is very difficult. 
Um, there's a lot of demands on them, um, first and foremost, their own safety in responding to crashes. And then the, the way the form is sold out, what they're responding to on the ground. And so there is that appreciation there. Um, and vice versa, uh, uh, some of our some of our law enforcement we spoke to really do have that collaborative relationship with the engineering and planning communities and want to have that reciprocal thing. So I just want to um, highlight that before we move on. As we move into this next year, as I mentioned previously, we are completing this needs assessment, which will be published in later in September. Um, we are going to be working on in developing and implementing solutions to some of these problems um, with the collective effort of this group of stakeholders that we've gathered, looking into what other MPOs and states are doing. And really what's um, something that I've taken an interest in is doing additional law enforcement engagement. We have had a great opportunity to speak with a number of law enforcement throughout this process, including a police chief from um, up north in our region, um, a traffic unit commander from another large city, um, several analysts and from, well, from local governments and several analysts, CSP. Um, I was able to attend the Colorado City Traffic Safety Summit as well last week, and that was a great opportunity to meet with other law enforcement in the region and really hoping to learn and glean more from their perspective. And they're going to be, I believe, uh, one of the, one of the um, key partners among many to help move our region forward in improving the, the state of our crash data so that everyone can use it to make our roadways safer. We are planning to have our next meeting of, of our consortium on September 28th um, at 10 o'clock. We have posted this on the Dr. Cog event calendar, and there is a link there. And with that, we'll be sharing out the results of our inventory a little bit more fully than in our previous meeting, um, talking about our needs assessment and really working to kind of build that capacity of this group to be able to take this project forward and I invite any of you who are interested to join or if you have staff or other colleagues who would be interested and have not um, been able to participate to let them know. Um, we're always looking to increase the capacity of this group and would be welcome you all to join. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Movie. I really enjoyed this presentation very much as well as your slides. Um, I would reiterate, without belaboring it, the interest in capturing single vehicle crashes that aren't um, reported to police and perhaps incorporate somehow the emergency room data, which you've identified, or the insurance data, which I've mentioned. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Commissioner Adams. Uh, one observation I have, and thank you, I, I appreciate your presentation as well. Uh, when I talk to some of my police officer friends, one of the things that they constantly tell me, and I ask, how short are we? You know, if you really look at the level of resources here, and I've been told numbers anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500, and I just question when we push for greater uh, involvement from the law enforcement or legal enforcement side, you know, it, it really is a resource question that given their demands on their time and their schedule, I just don't know if this could be it is a priority for them in terms of their involvement and their engagement here, given other things that they're being asked to do. Just, just a point. Other comments? Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Moving ahead, uh, the statewide program distribution update, Ron Papstorp, Director, Transportation Planning and Operations. The floor is yours. Morning. We'll get you out of here by 1030. I'll get through this pretty quickly. Did want to have a follow-up conversation with you. I think it was two months ago that we did an introduction to this topic around statewide uh, transportation funding program distribution that CDOT embarks on about every four years or so. Uh, the, the relevance of that, I think uh, you all saw a bit of that this morning in your meeting when you uh, recommended to our board adoption of the next four-year transportation improvement program for 24 through 27. That's allocation of future funds that have been estimated based on current program distribution formulas and the fund, you know, significant amounts of money like the multimodal mitigation um, options fund, right? That is state money that's uh, partially allocated to, to Dr. Cog and through our TIP to support investments in the transportation system to meet our regional objectives. Um, 
the funds that we use to to pay for our metropolitan planning organization functions that you all just recommended adoption of the next two-year unified planning work program that pays for the work that we do as a region to address the region's transportation issues. Those funds are allocated through a formula that's um, adopted at the at the state level to um, actually fund our work. So it's relevant to all of the work that we do. It's relevant to our regional transportation plan and how we formulate that plan to address this region's uh, priorities and the state priorities, right? And the things that the state is asking us to do in terms of contributing to the state's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, address the state's safety issues, right? All of these resource allocations are important to our ability to meet those demands. Um, we talked last time a little bit about um, this relationship to our work and how the funding is broken down by program areas. Um, I shared a lot of background information in the packet for you. I'm not going to go through all of that in detail. It's there for your reference. Uh, I just want to kind of continue to hit some highlights. Dr. Cog, the Denver region is defined as a transportation planning region, so it's not just the Metropolitan Planning Organization area, which is a, a smaller geography, most of the greater Denver area, transportation planning region, but not all of it. Um, we talked uh, two months ago about sort of some of some of the kind of Denver region, the TPR, sort of as a share of the state. 58% of the state's population, 64% of the state's employment uh, in this region, about 71% of statewide income and wages occurs within this region. So big sort of economic driver for the state. I, th I don't think that's news to anyone at all. Um, we've since uh, then we've also dug into some uh, some additional data. Uh, we're about half of the state's total trips per day uh, happen in this region. Uh, the vehicle miles traveled, which is the amount of travel um, on the state's highway system, were about 50% of the statewide vehicle miles traveled. Notably, 20% of the entire vehicle miles traveled on the state highway system occurs just on I-25 and I-70 in this region. So just those two facilities in the Denver region account for a fifth of the statewide total vehicle miles traveled every day. Um, when you look at the total federal aid system, sort of the major part of the transportation system that's in addition to and includes more than just the state highway system, we're 54% of, of that system of uh, vehicle miles traveled in, in the region. When you look at the state highway lane miles, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the presentation, we're about 19%. Uh, and, and if you think about those lane miles, there's a lot of there's a lot of rural state highways all over the state. We're a big state. There's big there's big sort of geographies in other transportation planning regions. So if you just look at uh, lane miles on the state highway system, we're about 19 percent of that total lane mile system. Um, at the same time, we're nearly 40 percent of the interstate freeway and expressway lane mile system. And I think we all might imagine that those are a bit more complicated to manage and to operate and improve than maybe a, a two-lane rural highway um, out in another part of the state. We're also about 25% of the entire federal aid highway system. Again, those, those sit that part of the system that's eligible to receive federal highway funds, investments. Uh, so we're a, we're a bigger share of that than just the, just the CDOT uh, system. And then we've had a lot of conversations this morning around safety. So we're about half of uh, total fatalities um, uh, of the state occur in this region. Um, notably on transit trips, we're about 70% of the state's total transit trips occur within this, Den within this Denver region. Um, also, um, new kind of new criteria, new thoughts around disproportionately impacted communities as a result of Senate Bill 260 a couple of years ago uh, that actually asked us and the state to consider impacts um, uh, of our transportation investments and planning um, on disproportionately impacted communities in Colorado. Um, Dr. Cog has the greatest number of designated disproportionately impacted communities and people identified under the state's disproportionately impacted community definitions. So over half, 50, 56% of all census blocks that are identified as DIC um, are located within the Denver uh, TPR. The next closest is Pikes Peak at 12%. 50% uh, of all low-income Coloradans reside in the Dr. Cog TPR area. That's triple the next closest TPR around the state. 
where about 60 percent of all people of color in the state reside in the Denver region, about five times the next closest TPR, and about 60 percent of all housing cost burden households in the state are located in Dr. Cog. So a lot of these issues that the state has said are important to consider in our transportation funding and our transportation decisions, um, obviously the Denver region accounts for a lot of those, a lot of those folks we're trying to serve. Um, when we approach program distribution conversations at the statewide transportation advisory committee or with our partners, I think there's some principles that we'd like to think about in terms of how those decisions are approached. Um, we think some, the formulas should be based on sort of the purpose and the uses of the program, um, not sort of and a desired outcome for how much money an area feels like they want to get or should get, right? We should think about what the purpose of the program is. We should define formulas in some way that considers where revenues raised um, along with the system needs. So, you know, even, even the state of Colorado pursues some federal policies about trying to receive some minimum return on investment from the, from the federal transportation revenues that are generated in the state State of Colorado believes it should get some portion of that back to the state of Colorado compared to other states. I think that's that's one principle that we think is important for this region. We know we're a big part of the economy in the state. We know we'll never get back exactly dollar for dollar for what we generate in terms of transportation revenues, but there should be some minimum return that, that's appropriate that helps us address sort of complexities of this transportation system. The definition of system needs should definitely consider sort of the purpose and desired outcomes of the program. So there should be some relationship between the formula components uh, and sort of what the, what the purpose and the outcomes of the program are. And then data points used in the distribution formula should be complete and they should be accurate. And I think those are important principles. Hopefully we would all agree on that. Do you want to do a deeper dive into lane miles because lane miles is one of those criteria, one of those categories that is often used in many of these um, uh, formulas uh, for distributing different parts of uh, the programs that are that are addressed through program distribution. Um, most of this data com this data comes from CDOT's online transportation information system, Otis. Um, it's and it's principally the on-system lane miles. So that's the state highway lane miles. What's interesting about the lane miles data in Otis that's, that's published that has historically been used for these programs is it does not include things like freeway ramps or freeway to freeway connections or frontage roads or auxiliary lanes that are part of the system. It really only addresses the through lanes on the state highway system. And that's principally because of the way the federal government tells CDOT they should report that data. Uh, but CDOT does have that data available. It's just not reported through Otis, so it historically hasn't been used in the program distribution. So it's not complete data. Um, also, the total lane miles data does not distinguish between different facility types like interstates and freeways and expressways, principal arterials, collectors, local. That data is available by what's called functional classification, uh, but it's only reported as a total lane mile. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and, but I think, as I talked earlier, these different facility types do have very different levels of complexity and need on the, on the state highway system. So just a quick example uh, comparing two facilities. Uh, this is Federal Boulevard south of I-70 in Denver. It's 0.2 miles long. It's four lanes. So if you think about a lane mile, it's one lane a mile long, excuse me for hitting the microphone, one mile long. This happens to be two, two tenths of a mile long, but it's four lanes. So it's 0.8 lane miles, right? It's, but it's classified in the Otis system as a principal arterial state highway. State Highway 318 west of Maybell out in Moffat County in northwest Colorado, uh, a little over a half a mile in length. It's two lanes. It's a major collector. It's 1.2 lane miles. So under many of the formula distributions that CDOT uses to distribute funding, these facilities count as the same, right? Despite the fact that State Highway 318 carries much fewer vehicles, um, doesn't have things like signals, curbs and gutters, sidewalks, turn lanes, all of those other things, that, you know, right? So I think kind of distinguishing the fact that different facility types have different needs, have different, different impacts uh, from a system standpoint, we think is an important consideration.
Um, just uh, kind of a couple of couple of final points. This is a this is an example of sort of Otis, the way that CDOT reports out data on the state highway system and lane miles, kind of versus maybe real world. So this section of I-25 just south of the interchange with I-225 uh, in, in Otis is uh, defined as nine lanes in Otis. That's the nine through lanes on I-25. But if you look at this picture of that corridor, it's actually 17 travel lanes, plus seven shoulders, plus barriers, plus lights, plus drains, overhead signs and markings, right? So 17 travel lanes in the real world versus nine through lanes that are reported in Otis. Again, I think just acknowledgement of the way the data is reported and used in program distribution doesn't quite capture the entirety of this system. And then just to, just to wrap up real quickly, just kind of upcoming impacts on RTPs and TIPs. So, um, and, and this is important, but the recommendations from staff and consideration by the Transportation Commission will happen in early 2024. Um, just by way of history lesson for folks that weren't around four years ago in 2019, just using one of the formula distribution programs, the Regional Priority Program, which is a state investment program that's really not even allocated to Dr. Cog as a TPR. It's allocated among the five CDOT regions. Um, you know, four years ago, the stack, the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee, 17 members were one, um, voted to adopt a recommended formula to the Transportation Commission that largely disadvantaged Region 1 and distributed more funding to other regions around the state. And the commission, not because Dr. Cog or Region 1 felt like they deserved more money, it's because the system needed more money and there needed to be more equity. The commission sort of overruled Stack and adopted a formula that was a little bit more fair for Region 1 and, and the Denver region. Um, last At the last Stack meeting, the Stack decided to adopt or uh, recommend the same formula that they recommended in 2019. So we'll be having a conversation with the commission about whether that's appropriate or not and whether that's the right decision to make moving forward. But these have real world impacts for this region. Um, we, we've adopted a regional transportation plan to achieve st statewide greenhouse gas emission reductions as mandated by the state. Um, we're adopting the next four year tip that that was based on previous program distribution decisions. And if those decisions change and change the amount of resources that come into this region, we won't be able to deliver fully on that tip that we're about to adopt. We won't be able to continue to do all of the planning work that we're doing as an MPO for, for this region. So, um, you know, those are, those are significant impacts, not only for sort of this current RTP, this current uh, next four-year TIP, but following following TIP cycles as well, and the update to the regional transportation plan that will be beginning next year. Happy to take any questions, Mr. Chair. And you promised we would be out in about a minute. So we'll see how <laughs> these go. Uh, let's start with uh, Commissioner Holkin. All right, let's see if we can get this going. Um, quick question regarding the the, the difference, 1.7 million. What would you say is the total impact when you consider the multiplier effect because of matching dollars? Oh, that's a really good question, uh, Commissioner Holtine. Uh, uh, so the regional priority program, the RPP, is not a specific funding color of money. It's an investment program that CDOT uses, and it's flexible dollars that are allocated among the five CDOT regions to sort of address regional issues, right, that sort of the TPRs, local officials, and the state decide are kind of priorities for those funds. Um, so I don't, depending on the mix of the, of the funding that goes into that, I, I'd have to know that to be able to answer your question directly. I guess I'm just trying to, to to show the picture that it's much more than this. And how do we do that in a way that's going to make sense? Because it's also, you know, it's easy to say, well, this is our region one, or this is very specific to Denver, but it's really not. This is something that is going to impact the entire state. And so not having that investment can be significant. So just let us I think that's a really good point, Commissioner. And I, I neglected to say that, you know, 
a lot of folks will say, well, the, the RPP formula, one, RPP is $50 million statewide, right? It's not a significant amount of money. A million, million seven hundred thousand dollars a year is a significant amount of money to Region One, but the but the broader point is the RPP formula. While it may not be precisely adopted as the program formula for other programs, it often is the starting point. So think about think about the way the state identified sort of the funding targets for the ten-year plan investments around the state. They started with the RPP formula. And instead of even using the commission adopted RPP formula, they defaulted to sort of what they called a compromise, which was halfway between the transportation commission adopted formula for RPP and the stack recommended formula. So it actually reduced even the investment target for this region for CDOT to invest in the transportation system, which then has an impact on our planning through our regional transportation plan, our ability through the 10 year plan investments that the state makes on the transportation system. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Ron. Um, cool stuff in here. Sadly, we are in the classic conundrum that is facing all of us. If I look at motor vehicle fees and motor fuel taxes and gas tax and roof, you know, it's all related to the car, and we really all have to get out of our cars. So we have the regional air quality gentlemen sitting here. And, and we have this conundrum that we are funding ourselves based on cars. That's sad. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And Ron, thank you for your continued diligence on this. I appreciate you bringing this to the attention of, of this group as well as our board of directors. I know it can be very exhausting at times in those stack meetings to try to build that argument in case. I, I think, you know, what we're trying to do as an agency, if nothing else, is try to try um, or make a suggestion that we should all be more thoughtful about how we're trying to utilize the funding, the limited resources we have within the state, and um, with a full understanding. And I appreciate you, you, you acknowledging that it's not necessarily about the regional priority pro program specifically. It's about that that's used as the foundation for other funding that we get. And um, it's just, you know, it's drip, drip, drip. I mean, it always seems to be, you know, a, it's unfortunate that, you know, because there are arbitrary numbers that are, go into the formula. I mean, you know, so it, to Ron's earlier point, it almost like, you know, they, they, they're trying to build an argument for a solution they would like to get or an, an amount that uh, regions will get. So we're, we're, we'll continue to fight the good fight provided by this group and our board is well appreciated. Any other comments? I just quickly wanted to thank Ron for this information. This was very helpful, and I'm glad that two of my commissioners were here to hear that presentation today. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you so much, Ron. Great presentation. Uh, one bit of housekeeping before we move to reports. If you park downstairs, this is the man that helps get you out. So be sure to get your parking uh, validation there. And with that, we will move ahead to uh, CDOT reports. All right. I, well, we're deciding who should go first. Um, just a, a couple of things. Of course, the Transportation Commission this month is going to be virtual. You can watch that on YouTube. It's uh, going to be a, a couple of items related to the budget, uh, establishment of a new fee for the new fuels impact enterprise, um, and North Front Range's GHG report. Um, so uh, we're uh, that's uh, upcoming this week. Uh, additionally, I mentioned this at the last board meeting, but I don't think I mentioned it at this meeting. Uh, that we do have a new DTR director. His name is Paul DeBrocher, and he started on July 31st. Great. Well, very relevant to today. Recently, there was a House bill passed, the Move Over Law, and I just wanted to talk about, um, you know, kind of reminding everybody that that exists, and if you're not familiar with it, please look it up. Um, I was out with my maintenance team last week in the center median of I-225, and I'll tell you that people are not following um, the law. So you can be an influencer, and generally the law talks about if you can't move over a lane, if there's 
um, an emergency vehicle or a, a vehicle with flashing lights, which also includes our maintainers when they're doing um, road work. Um, you need to move over a lane. If you cannot move over a lane to drop your speed limit by 20 miles per hour, um, you might be the most unpopular person. But when I did notice out in the median of people flying by, when someone would move over, others would follow. So very big opportunity to be an influencer there and have an impact on the safety of um, not only emergency responders, police officers, but our CDOT professional maintainers. Um, in addition to that, we've got a lot of construction on I-70 I uh, into the mountains and US-40, so please be patient. Lots of holes. We've got rock scaling, rock blasting on I-70 for the Floyd Hill project. You can sign up for live text messages, but we are holding traffic while that occurs. We've got construction on the 254 at the Wildlife Crossing. We've got resurfacing as you're coming out of the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel eastbound. We've got holds for resurfacing projects. So prime construction season, please slow down um, and, and really pay attention to where you're driving. That's all from Region 1. Thank you very much. Moving ahead to RTD reports. Brian says I can talk. <laughs> A um, couple things. I, I'm hoping everybody here knows that we're into our second month with a zero fare for better air and that you all have been taking advantage of that. We, we don't have any data points to report as yet or any insights on that, but when we do, we will share them here. Um, we also passed through the board of directors. Okay. Um, our revised fare structure, and if you haven't looked at it yet, it's really good. It's simple, it's accessible, it's equitable, um, it's better. So we are happy for that. And last but not least, we have also just initiated um, a marvelous program. It's historical for the region. It's zero fare for those 19 and under on all of our network for a full year. So if you have any contacts, we would really appreciate it if you would get that out because we want to see that population using transportation. It's good for them, it's good for all of us. So um, anybody who has any questions about how that works, we have a website on RTD, a page on RTD's website, and if not, you can call Brian um, his email is Brian Welsh at rtd denvercom Just a very quick one. I, I really do want to applaud and compliment RTD on what you're doing with the zero fare for both both initiatives that you just described. I, I can tell even in my community when I pass by the stops this year versus in the past when we've had the fare programs, it looks to me that there are more users and the signage on the, on certainly the buses make it very, very clear what the opportunity is. So I, I really think it's a, it's a good thing and certainly uh, I want to just make sure that I say that. Thank you. Um, you'll also appreciate the fact that the bus drivers say that people are so happy. It's the number one report we get from our union operatives that people get on and they're just happy that they they don't have to go through all the hassle, even with the simpler fares. Just a quick aside, I want to uh, call attention to the fact that the airport uh, is doing a Sunday concert uh, like six weeks. Phil Washington uh, basically created that and it's it's part of a, an equity move in terms of, of of hiring and talking about jobs at the airport, but it's also about getting people on the train. And uh, I think it's been great. I've been out there the past two weeks. I'll be out there this week too. And it, it, it's, it's cool to watch the number of people that are, are riding the train to the airport for the first time. Phil, Phil has some experience with RTD. Yes, he does, absolutely. But just exciting program. Report from REC. Yes, thank you. And um, just a couple updates for everyone. Um, our latest air quality plan for summertime ozone will be advancing to the Air Quality Control Commission uh, for the fall um, consideration. And that plan it projects that we will attain the, uh, the weaker of the two ozone standards that are, we're required to achieve by 2027. Uh, we've had a gr very good summer this year. Great meteorology has really helped us, the, the cloud cover, the rain, the turbulent atmosphere. So um, better air quality um, for everyone this year and hopefully 
um, you know, our, our projections come true in 2027 and we'll reach attainment. So there'll be, a, I'm sure, media and a lot of attention to our air quality initiatives over the fall here. We're also advancing um, a lawn and garden equipment proposal to the Air Quality Control Commission um, that would restrict the use of gas-powered um, small equipment by commercial operators and local governments and state governments and federal agencies, anyone in the public sphere um, in, in the future, in the summertime, and also um, uh, prohibit the sale of the same small equipment to everyone um, beginning in 2025 and beyond. So that will gain a lot of attention and um, already being called to the woodshed um, with our, our, our government agency partners to, um, to explain ourselves and hopefully um, we'll, we'll convince them that this is the uh, appropriate move forward to uh, and, and gain their support. Um, and finally, um, lawn and garden equipment grants. So to, to accommodate the, the future restrictions, the RAC has money. We, we, want, we hope everyone goes to our website, raqc.org, to um, take advantage of the lawn and garden equipment grants. We have lots of money, to, especially to agencies. So any of you in agencies that have electric or, excuse me, gas-powered equipment, you are eligible for $100,000 of our money to, um, to gain um, – electrified, uh, uh, an electrified fleet so you can comply easily with the future programs if they're adopted. So that's just a quick update. There's some other things, but we'll touch on that next month. Thank you very much. Any other matters uh, that we are adjourned next meeting, September 19th. See you then. Thank you for being here today. Appreciate all your work.